So we're doing it now. It's not going to be a long one. So hopefully if anyone decides to jump on, jump on. If not, you can watch this afterwards. Whew. So, yes, I'm in my car. No, I am not driving. And the reason this is going to be a sh** is because my phone apparently got uh, water damaged. And I don't really think it did. I think it's the sensor that says it's water damaged. And uh, I can't charge it conventionally. I have to use this like a, a wireless charger, but I can't really hold it to the phone very well. Also, it doesn't charge very fast. So this is gonna be a short live stream. I don't know how much battery life my phone has. You can't see the display. We got somebody on Austin. Hello, Austin. Okay, we're getting a couple of people now. Hello, hello, hello. If you missed it, guys, it's gonna be a shorter live stream because the battery life of my phone is gonna, gonna die and I can't charge it as I speak because the, there's water damage in the charging port. I keep having very annoying. YouTube wants to tell me about all these new features and it just puts these little notifications like right in front of the screen I'm trying to utilize for this live stream. Okay, and then it goes away, but then the, uh, the comments go away too and I don't want the comments to go away. All right, so when I first said I was gonna do a live stream at, I think I originally said it's six o'clock today. Um, and then I remembered that Kamar Usman, Leon Edwards three was today. Or as we as we true fans know the event, the Gaethje Fazeev throwdown with uh, the main event just happening to be Kamar Usman. But uh, yeah, so I'm in my car. I'm on my way back from my family's house. I was watching it out there with them. That's also why I started it just a few minutes late because I was grabbing something to drink. Coconut water, by the way. If you if you don't know, this stuff is amazing. Because my throat is dead after the Gaethje fight. How is it still daylight? It's not. Um, it's nighttime. These are um, parking lot, like overhead lights. I parked in, on purpose in the brightest lot I could see. Hey man, I enjoy watching your content. Thank you. Keep rocking it. I will do my best. I appreciate it. What a UFC event. Yeah, it was a really good one. Um, you know, the, the UFC has this thing where they'll put on all these like great fights and like the apex and stuff. And I think we've been kind of forgetting how electric the crowds can be, especially with a hometown crowd behind one of the main event fighters like, uh, like they were for Leon tonight. But really good fights all the way up and down the card. Everybody brought it. It was great. What is the most delicious fish to eat? Depends on who you ask. Um, I think somebody asked me this in the last one. I'm going to say um, flounder. KDP says I thought Leon won. I agree. Uh, he, I think he edged it. I think it was a pretty... It was one of those fights. It was like Aldo Mendez too, where it was really close, but you still knew who won. Um, really, really good. I, that cage grab, though, was awful. He did lose a point for it, but you, again, you got to ask yourself, what would have happened if he had got taken down? Because was, Usman was dragging him down away from the fence. Um, would he have gotten up? Would he not have gotten up? Who knows? But it is what it is, as uh, as Max Holloway would say. I see you still have the hair. Yeah, so guys, if you don't know, if this is what you're referencing, um, I work with Salt Strong, um, and I, I utilize their awesome lures. And uh, I mentioned that you could grab a free bag by claiming like a free bag in the link of a video, and I made a deal with everyone. I said, if I get a certain number. I think I said a thousand. If a thousand people claim a free bag of lures, I would shave my head on camera. A thousand people didn't do it. So yeah, the hair's still here. Flounder's dope. I'm partial to bluefin tuna myself. Does sushi count? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if sushi counts, then you probably have to go some kind of like fatty tuna. Yeah. 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 If we're going sushi, I'm going tuna. I love your videos. You catch some crazy big fish. You know, I try. <laughs> I try to keep that up as much as possible. Salmon is one of my favorites. Walleye. I've never had walleye. Um, I hear walleye is just among the best, uh, you know, freshwater fish you can have, but I've never had it. Need to come to Houston and catch some alligator gar. Definitely make it happen. This is the time of year where they start biting. Hello, Peyton. Hi. Uh, getting confirmations that yes, you you got your lures. Please don't shave your hair. If you've been watching the channel for any number of, like of years, like there's some people on here who, you know, may have been watching for a couple of weeks or months, and then there's some people who've been watching for you know the 
entire four or four and a half years I've been doing it. This is the least consistent thing on the YouTube channel. My hair has changed a bunch of times from being longer than this to being almost non-existent. Sturgeon is very good. Yeah. That's interesting. I guess if you're going after like, I don't know, maybe smaller white sturgeon, it's not such a big deal to keep those ones. I know enough about it to decide whether or not I'm comfortable with the idea of, of uh, keeping them. But I am actually putting plans together to go sturgeon fishing. I know I said that last time, but like they're actually starting to become concrete plans now. Try snakehead. I did. I went to Florida. If you haven't seen it, guys, I, uh, I have a snakehead catching cook both on my Patreon, and then I have a second Snakehead Catch and Cook I did, a different video, on my other channel, the food channel, and you are correct, Snakehead is very good. Yeah, a lot of people are saying Snakehead is good, I agree with you all, it, and I, I just cooked it, like, in a parking lot, like, because I was doing car camping, so nothing fancy, just a little bit of salt, I cooked it on, like, a gas burner I brought, and it was still very good. Been here for almost two years, which has gone by very fast. Yes, it, it's incredible how fast it goes by. How can you be a conservationist while also showing spots to millions who can, with any experience, find your spot on Google Maps and catch plus kill gar? First off, I don't give away spots for gar. Second, you can't convince people that they're not allowed to look for where you are. People can look for the spots that Steve Irwin goes to when his wildlife specials, Jeff Corwin. It is important to show people the animals that you want them to conserve. You have to go to a location to do it. And with today's technology, the vast majority of people with enough effort can find where you're going. It doesn't matter if you're fishing or if you're hosting a wildlife channel, you know, on National Geographic. You have to go to locations to show the animals in the wild. And you have to do that to get people to care about the, the animals so that they will conserve them or want to conserve them or participate in other people actively conserving them. So that is how I call myself a conservationist while doing that, because that's the way it has to be done. You should be blaming the other people who have the nerve to go kill those animals instead of the person who goes on location to show how incredible they are and share that information a long time ago. That's a long time ago. Trust me, it's not easy to find his spots. Again, some of them like Guys, it's not it's not like a secret. Some of these spots, like I don't give away some of the river spots and stuff like that, but it's not a secret that you can find these fish like downtown. And I'm not going to like blur out the Houston skyline behind me. Like you need to focus more on quelling. Is that the right word? Quelling um, to spread conservation inter uh, information. Always catch and. and um, Depending on the species, that makes sense. I mean, everybody's got a different taste. A lot of people tell me they love catfish. I don't like catfish at all. And honestly, if you're going to eat one, as far as like, you know, being concerned about the fish population, catfish are probably the one to eat because they're not in any form of trouble whatsoever. I just don't like it. Let's see. Love your thoughts on gar. Way too laugh. You know, they've put in place regulations that you have to report fish that you're catching and keeping. And you have uh, a limit of how many you can keep per day, but that doesn't really do enough. And you have these fish that take 10 years to reach sexual maturity and can live as long as, you know, potentially 80 years, depending on what researcher you're talking to. The 50 is kind of the accepted um, baseline for how old they can be. And then depending on who you talk to, that's where the agreement comes in on how old they can get to be. You take a fish that's been around for 60, 70 years out of the environment, that's your one fish per day, but it's gonna take 60 to 70 years to replace that fish. They reproduce so slowly, there have to be stronger. Ooh, that guy driving behind me is booking it through the parking lot. <laughs> I was worried he's going to hit me. But anyway, yeah, I would like to see uh, Texas treat gar the way Florida treats uh, a lot of shark species. What go gulf fish would be good to eat raw? Probably none of them. I read a study that came out a few years ago where they were testing... Um, a variety of fish caught in the Gulf and uh, Gulf of Mexico, if you're not from Texas, listening to this. And every single one of them had uh, chemical pollutants found in the, in the meat. Now, granted, the chemical pollutants are still there when you cook the fish, depending on the type of pollutant that, that you're eating, uh, especially if it's like heavy metals and stuff like that. But uh, I, I can't imagine that, at least if you're cooking them, you're getting rid of something, you know? <laughs> um, I eating any kind of raw meat because i mean think about like beef tartare that's raw 
uh, it has a lot to do with the quality of how the animal is raised or where it lives and the water that it's found in. If you're talking about fish, uh, that's what makes it safe to eat. And then uh, sushi chefs and stuff, they have like all these different, sometimes they'll flash freeze fish. Sometimes they'll like inspect raw fish that's thinly sliced with like a flashlight. That's actually one of the things I think, um, yeah, I think Joe Rogan was talking about that in his last, one of his last episodes, the one where he's watching my stuff. Um, they were reading an article about that. But yeah, um, I would not recommend eating gulf fish raw. By the way, can you hop off my spots? One of my flathead spots you leaked on Patreon. Now people showed up in trucks catching and killing. I'm willing to bet you're drawing a conclusion between two things that isn't really there. I have like 40 people max on my Patreon and about half of them don't live in Texas. So no, I'm not leaking spots. And they're not yours anyway, man. Anyone can find these spots with a little bit of information. Where you find the gar? Um, a lot of places within Texas anyway. You have to clean catfish right. Yeah, that's what they say. You have to clean catfish right. Um, there's like a like a, a layer of like, I don't know if it's the meat that is like not palatable or if there's like a layer of fat in it that makes it taste bad. Um, but yeah, I know what you're, what you're talking about is probably correct. I've probably had catfish that was not cleaned by, by someone with that level of experience. When you think about eating at like a restaurant, typically speaking unless it's a higher end restaurant um you know it's a, a business first and they're trying to serve food at a certain pace uh so you know a lot of um like restaurants serving fish are just trying to to get food served you're a better fisherman than me i don't care ever been to new england to fish um i want to go so bad new england looks beautiful i'd love to go just even to not fish how do you what are your thoughts on, oh, the Ikijime method. I might be saying that wrong. Um, it's a method of, for anyone who doesn't know, what he's talking about is a method of dispatching fish so that the meat doesn't spoil. So basically, if you catch a fish, you have this little apparatus with a very long needle. So you insert like a, like a guiding tube, like a needle basically, but a thick gauge needle, like into the fish's forehead. Uh, and then you run a longer needle through it back and forth to cut through and um, kind of disrupt the, the nerve connections to the spine. And that stops the fish's nervous system from sending messages to the meat to flex. You know, when you kill a fish, it still flexes. Um, and when you do that, it actually prolongs the life of the, the flesh and it makes it taste better. I think that method probably is exceptionally, like I, I would recommend it. Uh, I can't think of words to put to what I'm trying to say, but um, I want to learn how to do it. I want to learn how, for, how to do it from somebody who is experienced doing it. Uh, and uh, I want to put it into practice if I catch and keep any fish because I, I think it's something worth learning. Have any monster monsters videos in the editing? Oh, do I have any videos that I'm editing right now with monsters in them? I am releasing a video tomorrow morning that has a very unique fish I have never caught before. And from the research I've done, it is very rare. And I've caught a very big one. So yes, tomorrow morning, get ready for a video. Let's see. Never tasted a bad catfish? Yeah, that's the thing. Everybody's got a unique taste. A lot of people love catfish. What if the fish hunts me down instead? Um, as long as I get it on camera. Aft, Aftco makes those circuit breakers. Circuit breakers, what you mean, are you talking, are we talking about like the Ikejime? If, again, if you speak Japanese, if you're familiar with the pronunciation of Japanese and I'm butchering it, I apologize. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. AFCO is a really good big game, like tackle company. Are all the fish in the canals inedible? I would assume that they are, yes. When you're down by those canals, you can smell the chemicals in the water, uh, you know, from a distance. So don't don't eat anything. Um, like if, you, if you're talking about like Braze Bayou downtown, like the areas that I kind of got known for fishing, I would definitely recommend you do not eat those fish. What's up, Peyton? Great to be here. Psychic Psych Toad coming through as always. I appreciate it, man. Catfish do not have... Somebody said catfish have a mud line in them. Catfish do not have a mud line. It's the dark red flesh you're talking about. That's what gives you the mud, quote unquote, taste. Yeah, I think mud line is like a colloquial... Man, I'm, I'm chewing up my words here. Colloquial? Um, expression to refer to the same thing. You guys are just using different words to talk about the same thing. Uh, you're, you're, you're actually just explaining the, the technical side of it. But I think when he said mudline, that's the general idea of what he's getting at. 
bleed them out and put them on ice. Yes, again, that's very important. If you're if you're keeping eating fish. Let's see. Oh, when am I coming to fish in New Zealand? Okay, so my wife is good friends with someone that she works with um, who will probably end up in New Zealand. I want to speak on her behalf. Uh, but I, I do believe that is the uh, like the plan that has been spoken out loud. So I'm trying to convince my wife, we need to go to New Zealand and visit her like when, when she goes over there. Um, I'm working on it. Let's see. Want to fight you in a death match? Uh, nah, not interested. Unless we can do it in um, a Thunderdome arena, and then I'll do it. Two men enter, one man leaves. Yeah, if I can dress like Mad Max, where you're on. Yes, the product is called Circuit Breaker. You're talking again about the one offered by Aftco. I will look into that then. Um, he's saying that I pronounced it correctly. That's good to know. Uh, I think Japanese is probably, in my opinion, and again, this is just opinion, um, I would consider it the most beautiful of all languages. I love the sound of the Japanese language, uh, followed closely by German. I love the way those languages sound. Will you go to the 31st Galveston Pier? Uh, eventually, yeah. I did buy a big hoop net for pier fishing. I don't like being around a lot of people when I'm trying to film. I just find it distracting. Also, I'm not that great at pier fishing, and you have to pay a lot of money to fish out there. So, yeah, we'll see. Have I gone carp fishing recently? Not, no, I haven't actually. Let's see. What fo what fish will I focus on this spring? Uh, definitely, definitely I'm gonna be focusing a lot on alligator gar. I mentioned before, I can't remember if it was in a post or a live stream or something, but I said I was gonna try to take the opportunity to travel a lot more. Um, so I don't want to give anything away, but I've got some I've got some things planned that are starting to actually take a, a concrete form um, regarding traveling. I love your videos. I watch it again. I appreciate it. Where's the spot sandblaster? I don't know what you mean by that. What's going on? Hey man, what's going on? Doing a live stream in the car after a great night of fights. People, please stop using the term mudline. <laughs> I I do agree. Um, it's one of those things, I will tell you, from a position of a professional educator um, who, who works in a field, conservation, that is, um, what's, what am I, what am I trying to say? It is, um, the focus needs to be on intent. Conservation is a field that is intent oriented when you're teaching. So you might have people who constantly use wrong or colloquial or, uh, you know, just local nicknames for terms. And that could be annoying because you want them to use the proper term that you know. But at the end of the day, the field of conservation, and when we're talking about properly dispatching fish, I feel like that kind of fits. You know, it's always good to properly dispatch an animal um, in what, that you're harvesting or hunting or fishing. Uh, you know, I feel like the intent is more important than whether or not people are using the correct word. It, it is important to learn the correct terminology at a certain point, but if the intent is still there and the intent is still good, I'm not as concerned about terminology. Hello, wildlife. I'm going to read your comment in a British accent in my head because you said hello. Hello, J-H. A deep movie cut there if you know what I'm referencing. I love your videos and I've watched most of them. Just wanted to say thank you for inspiring me to fish more often and for me to fish for a larger fish. Man, I you're welcome. I'm glad I could, could do that for you. Too much fly fishing. Uh, I don't. I actually did buy a, a fly fishing rod and reel uh, in line and flies recently to do some fly fishing. I just haven't had the chance. <laughs> Next time you're fishing on the northwest side of Houston, I have a honey hole. I, I believe you. I believe you. I don't, man, the weather is so unpredictable. I If I wanted to tell everybody where I was fishing next, I wouldn't even know where to go. Like what to tell you because I don't know. When am I going to come down fishing in Corpus Christi? Um, soon. Soon. I actually got pretty good at flying a, the Swell Pro drone that I have the other day. Um, I was fishing. I was doing some fishing with um, H, the H-Town Angler shark fishing team. Um, Brian, I was doing fishing with Brian specifically, and uh, he taught me how to fly that drone. I got pretty good at it. So now that I'm confident with that and I don't feel the need to truck the kayak around to do like shark fishing, I will be down to Corpus Christi more often. Let's see. 
We have alligator gar in creeks or in the creeks. Yeah, they, they can move into some incredibly shallow, you know, small water. Let's see. You went to the zoo today and sat at a lion's exhibit looking for the... Al oh, yeah, the Houston Zoo has an enormous alligator gar in their lion exhibit. So there's a huge um, moat, if you will, in the lion exhibit. It has an alligator gar that's been there for many, many years. Uh, you, you just have to stay there long enough, you'll see it come up. Have I considered fishing in Europe? Yes, constantly. Uh, of all the fish right now internationally that I want to catch, uh, the big one on the list is Wells Catfish. I think I said that in the last live stream. And there's a couple of countries you can go for that. You know, Europe has um, enormously large Wells Catfish. You know, you, you have the small to medium-sized ones in the UK, but then you have the giants in, I think, France, uh, Germany, and uh, Spain and Italy. I think Germany might be on the medium-sized, but Spain, Italy, and France have the giants. I want one so bad. Oh, yeah, you even put that in the in the end of your comments, lures, which is the family that most catfish are found in, or at the very least, a lot of catfish are found in. Let's see. Da, da, da. Ran into a guy fly fishing a neighborhood pond in the northwest side of Houston for dinky bass. You know, fly fishing is really an art. Uh, I consider it much more about the appreciation of the form than whether you're catching a giant fish. And on the, to be fair, there are guys who can do both. Uh, but to put it in martial arts terms, uh, fly fishing is the beautiful kata of fishing so if you ever like watch martial arts practitioners and learn you know practice like the memorize steps of forms and stuff like that that's a kata uh fly fishing reminds me of like the beautiful like kata of uh of fishing let's see not british just a habit from your british friends you know you pick up you pick up language habits like that from people you hang out with have i received my 100k plaque already yes i I think I, I showed it off when I hit the 100,000 subscribers and did the um, the big 100,000 Q&A. I showed it off. It's in my room. Let's see. How are your brothers always watching? How are your brothers always good clients? In? How are you, brother? Sorry, I, was, I thought you were asking how my brothers watch my videos. I was like, well, anybody can watch my videos. It's just on the internet. Uh, how are you, brother? Always watch your videos. Good bites at Anahuac, Massive Reds. Yeah. Um, real. I was actually near that area recently, um, and I caught a really nice black drum. Let's see. Enjoying your lot. Enjoying the YouTube live, but I do have to go. Well, man, have a great night. I'm glad you checked in. Ever want to go to the Amazon? Yes, I think any real fisherman wants to go to the Amazon. Absolutely. Did I watch the Gaethje fight today? You bet I did. What a fight. I thought Fazeev was going to get the better of him. Uh, you know, I, I predicted Fazeev by decision. Um, but Gaethje, man, we talked, my brothers and I talked about this before the fight, that one of the keys to victory would be uh, slapping on the single collar tie, which is, if you guys study Muay Thai, the single collar tie is one hand down the back of the head. And when you do it properly, I mean, like, you can grab the back of the neck. That's kind of a sloppy way to do it. Really, you want the palm on the back of the head. And you pull the head down elbow and tight you can get that by uh, hooking at your opponent so you don't have to reach in and grab it you can actually throw a hook and if that hook lands you get a land you know you land the hook but if the hook goes around the back of the head you get that free collar tie when it lands and Gagey was doing an amazing job of throwing the hook slapping on the collar tie and then throwing the cross counter uppercut under the other arm and i think that's the technique that won him that fight incredible fight incredible i loved every second of it What college do I go to? Well, I'm not in college, man. I'm like 34, or I'll be 34 this year. Uh, but I mean, depends on what you want to study, you know. Have you ever heard of? Have I ever heard of or used an Alvi reel? I just bought my first one. Can't wait to try it. I have heard of them. I haven't used one. I fly fish. I haven't caught anything yet, though, as I got it for this Christmas. So you're still, if you're still new at it, I mean, there's no shame in that. It's a very difficult form of fishing. It took me a long time to get the first couple of fish. And even still, I'm not very good at it. 
Uh, hard to fly fish in Texas? Yeah, it really is. I mean, you can, you know, they make a lot of fly fishing gear for bass that I think would work well in, in Texas. But yes, overall, it's not quite as easy as some other states. Let's see. I run... Intona fly guy here in Kingwood. Into a fly guy here in Kingwood. He was taught by his father. Dude catches nice bass around here. Yeah, just, I mean, it depends on where you go. What would you consider a decent carp size? I've been catching five to eight pounders and recording it, but still trying to edit it. I mean, that's a good size, really. Um, carp get enormous, but that shouldn't detract from the fact that you're catching very nice carp. Five to eight pounds is a very decent fish. Uh, and really, what I've, what I've learned over the years doing you know youtube is that it has a lot more to do with how you film what you're doing than what you're catching let's see when you have a chance go down to florida try some cubera snapper fishing i would love to i was actually just in florida uh and i did not have a very good trip this is my third trip in like a couple of months uh the first one was good the second one was great uh this one not great. I got some good films. Um, one of the very good films that I'm proud of and I'm happy with, you'll see tomorrow. But that one and then the one I've already posted are the only ones I got out of it. Uh, but Kubera Snapper, yeah, man, I've heard people say that they, a lot of people seem to share the opinion that pound for pound, along with like Giant Trevally, they're some of the hardest fighting fish. What is my favorite fish ever? Um, probably have to say Alligator Gar. Do I fish with other people? Not often. Uh, I will do collabs from time to time, um, but I generally don't because it's the moment you start having to base your schedule around another person's schedule, uh, it cuts down on what you can do. And if you don't catch any fish, you know, doing this full time, that's not really something I can live with. So a lot of the times, if I'm having a really bad day fishing somewhere, I will move spots and I will do it three or four times if I have to until I have something that I can put on film and make a good film out of. And when, when you're with another person, that becomes more difficult. The upside to that is you can fish with people who have knowledge and experience you don't, and it can help you catch fish you otherwise would not have been able to catch. So occasionally I do fish with other people, other YouTubers, but it's, uh, it's rare. Do I ever plan on trying to do a video in another country? Absolutely. Um, working, working on hopefully eventually I would love to this year go across the pond to uh, the UK somewhere, don't know where yet, and go for Wells Catfish. It's the Sal from Berkeley, California. When are we going to see some halibut? Oh man, the season is over here, but a whole lot smaller than Alaska. I would love to catch one of them dinosaur alligator gar. Yeah, I said in a video recently, actually one of my uh, most recent videos that uh, I considered alligator gar the hardest fish to handle, like once you've caught them, once you're holding onto them. Um, and I, I even put it in text on the screen because afterwards when I was editing, I was like, oh, like I wanted to keep the footage, but I realized what I was saying was not necessarily true if you count halibut, which are by far the hardest fish to hold on to once you caught them. So I put text in there. I was like, halibut, like I'll accept that over alligator gar if you think that. Let's see. I am here, was watching on the phone, came inside to say hi on the computer. Hello, uh, insolent stickleback. Glad that you're here. Let's see. Why do I moan while reeling in fish? Because these fish weigh hundreds of pounds and it's very hard. Uh, usually guys, these fish, these alligator garb that weigh, you know, 100, 150, upwards to 300 pounds, uh, you are putting as much pressure on them as possible because they are trying very hard. This is an animal that is much bigger than you and much stronger than you. They are trying to pull their head down into trees and you have to muscle them back. It's one of the things I get annoyed about when people say like, I wish you would just play the fish. It's like, you can't play these fish. These rivers are just full of dead trees and rocks and these fish know exactly where they are. You have to muscle these fish. Uh, fighting alligator guard is a lot like fighting stingray in that sense. You cannot play them. You have to bully them. And it's very, very hard. And a lot of the times these fights are coming off of, you know, the end of eight, 10, even 12 hour days. Sometimes I don't get these bites until the end of the day, guys. It may not look like that because I edit it to be a, you know, a watchable video. But sometimes when you see me catch these fish that are like 100, 150 pounds, 
it's after an entire day of fishing and being out in the heat in the mud and I'm exhausted and now I have to fight this animal that is so much bigger and stronger than I am. That's why I moan when I'm fighting these fish because it's like, Ugh! it's like lifting weights. It's hard. How many hours do you move? After how many hours do I move spots? Uh, it's a vibe. It depends entirely on how I'm feeling. Well's catfish would be sick. I agree. The, I'm telling you guys, um, if you don't already watch it, you should watch uh, Yuri Grugensen's catfish. Uh, he's like the world's best guy at Wells catfish. And he will, he's the one who uploads all these like viral videos of the Wells like taking whopper ploppers off the top and he's catching them from like, uh, like the pontoons and stuff. I'm pretty sure that's Yuri Grugensen that does that. Really, really cool. What program do I use for video editing? Uh, Premiere Pro. I do not use the GoPro software. I use uh, Premiere Pro. Let's see. Let's break into the old Astroworld property and fish splash mountain. I, I've i looked at the Astroworld property a hundred times. I'm pretty sure they have completely demolished it all. I've looked on every map app I can find. I've read articles about what was the last thing to be taken down. I don't think there's anything left because I've tried to, to make that video happen. Vlog your fishing trip start to finish? No, they would last 14 hours on some days. Um, and I don't have the, the battery life to do that. I, I have like 12 GoPro batteries, um, and th that would not last me the entire day. Also, uh, I enjoy doing live streams, guys, but as you'll be able to see, I don't know if you can see it now, but after this video is complete, you'll notice the view count on the live stream uh, is always going to be a fraction of whatever your subscriber count is. And that is true of everyone. Uh, I was actually watching... Um, what is his name? Is it Roberto Blake? He does an incredible, um, he has an incredible channel about like analyzing uh, the world of, of like YouTube analytics and stuff. And even he comes into the same problem. He has so many more subscribers than me. So whenever I like get requests like, oh, live stream the fishing adventure. Well, if I catch, you know, what if I went out and I caught, let's say a 200 pound alligator gar. Well, let's say I caught one that was like seven and a half feet long, weighed 200 pounds. And now that's, visible to everyone on the live stream you know if i get three four thousand views on that live stream that's going to be three four thousand people that won't initially click on that video because they'll figure out that's what it was they'll be like oh yeah no i saw this i'll click on it later and that means they don't click on it at all uh getting clicks on your youtube video is a lot like a sales job if you guys have ever worked in sales there's an expression that if you don't get them before they leave you don't you're not going to get them so like when people walk into a store and you're trying to sell them on something if you let them go saying like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Definitely, I'll think about it. That means you've lost the sale. And it's very true with YouTube clicks as well. If people look at your video and they go, oh, yeah, I'll click on that in a little bit. It's not going to happen. Um, do, 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 do. He's telling the truth. You've got some gar over 100 pounds and you have to muscle them in. Yeah, man, if you know, you know. It's, uh, it's hard work. Let's see, I'm heading out to get some beer. Uh, get some good beer. I'm not really a beer guy. I'm a whiskey guy. Um, but uh, I, I worked in a bar for a while, uh, actually, as a bartender. Uh, it was actually one of those axe-throwing venues. They had a bar, and that was kind of my favorite job to do was to uh, run the run the bar. And uh, one day, like, one of the, um, like, beer kegs exploded in my face. So I don't drink beer, but in that instance, I did. Because it's like a fountain in my face. You're swallowing it, whether you want to or not. And I was like, this is good. It's really good. It was like some kind of weird craft beer. I don't know what it was. It was like an Astros-themed beer. Do challenges like make your own custom lures and baits. Did I do a challenge recently? Oh, I kind of did the bullfrog bait challenge. Um, not really as extreme as some other challenges. I mean, that's kind of obvious. People catch bait, you know, fish with frogs all the time. But I'm trying to, to get more into that. I ease, I'm easing into it with more reliable um, videos than like doing something extreme like, you know, can I catch a fish with no, like no hook, no lure, just fishing line? Like, I, we're not gonna start there yet because I, I do have to get something at the end of the day or I don't make money. Would love to see the Wells catfish. I, I would love to have one. I'd like to do a challenge guard trip against you. I'll stay in my area, fish with cut bait. Ooh, that'd be fun. 
That's why you need quality thumbnails. I have quality thumbnails. I, I'm not, not talking about the live stream. I'm just making the live face. Um, when I do these live streams, they're few and far between. So I just go into the live stream and I just, you know, click on, you know, like the the photo comes up to upload the, the thumbnail. And I just make a weird face. But I'm telling you guys, even like the best YouTubers, when they do live streams, they get a lower, a significantly lower number than their subscriber base. That's just the way it is. What's up from New Mexico? Love the channel. Thank you. I don't think I've, I think I've driven through New Mexico, like on the way to Colorado, but I don't think I've ever, I've never visited New Mexico, but I would love to. Let's see. What's your favorite episode on my own channel? Ooh. Well, when I watch my own stuff, which I do by the way, but not for entertainment, I watch it over and over and over, uh, as a quality control. So like videos, like I'm going to publish a video tomorrow and I have seen it like 10 times because I watch it over and over and over to make sure I didn't say something I shouldn't have said. Um, or, you know, like there, there's one video I made where I didn't realize until like the fifth time rewatching it that I had inadvertently shown the fish off. It was in a cityscape and there was the most horrific graffiti behind me. When I mean horrific graffiti, I mean the worst slurs imaginable. And on the fifth time rewatching it, I was like, oh my God. And it was like, five hours before I was going to upload it and I had to go back in and edit it out. So I do watch my own stuff um, for that reason. And I also watch it so I can do two other things. Number one, try to keep the vibe consistent. Uh, so I watch progression between videos to see, cause you want your videos to get better, but you also want to establish um, like a filmmaking process that people can recognize. You know, think of your favorite directors. They all have a style you can recognize. You want to establish your own style. Uh, I still don't think I'm there yet. I still don't think I've established a style you would recognize quite yet that I'm happy with at least. So I watch it for you know quality control to kind of look at where my own style is. And then I watch it uh, to see if I can one-up myself. I look at the last video and I think, what did I do in this video that works so well? Let's see if I can do it better. But to answer your question, if I had to pick a favorite episode, I mean, I'm kind of getting a broken record status at this point, but it's got to be the one where I caught the giant fish I'm, I'm known for. I mean, that that episode literally changed my life. Have you ever come out to California and fished the Delta? I haven't been to California. I want to go so bad. Going to see any collabs with any bigger YouTubers anytime soon? Maybe. I've got something very cool happening later this year. Um, there's a There's a piece of... There's an information page for something that's going to happen that I'm waiting to be updated to include yours truly, who is now officially slated to be a part of it. And I'm very excited to share that with you guys. So when that happens, I will answer that question when, when the when the thing gets up, updated. How can we stop those tournaments that kill Gar for sport? Um, lobby. Lobby and vote. You know, you want to get behind people like uh, Dr. Solomon David who's doing tremendous work um, to push the conservation of alligator gar forward. Uh, we need people who have incredible pull with um, you know social media, guys like Coyote Peterson, who is a very strong advocate for the conservation of alligator gar. Uh, we need average fishermen to speak up on behalf of alligator gar. The push for conservation needs to be much, much stronger, and it needs to come from many, many more voices. That's one of the things I got so excited about when Joe Rogan was watching my video. Even though he didn't say the name of my channel, um, you know, the very fact that a video that features the topic of alligator gar conservation, which it does, I go into a whole spiel after I release that fish, got featured on a platform of that size. That was the thing I was actually most excited about was the idea that that conservation message has legs for like more more legs now and again that, that goes back to one of the reasons i film myself uh, if somebody was asking me how can i be a conservationist if i film myself catching these fish um and just think about what happened last year um this is not bragging this is just a, a fact when i caught that fish it went viral and i was given the platform the opportunity to talk about the importance of alligator gar conservation to a bigger global audience than anybody has ever had, except for maybe Jeremy Wade during the first season of River Monsters. Um, I was interviewed by newspapers in, I think it, I counted out 
10 countries um, in South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, just all over the world, Canada, I was able to talk to millions and millions of people about alligator gar conservation because I went to a location where I could show one to a camera. So we need more advocates in every single corner pushing conservation forward. A really good example, just to give you guys some hope because I think it could happen now. Um, when uh, the Tiger King documentary came out, um, and I think this probably had a lot to do with it, um, I don't think a lot of people recognize just how terrible United States laws are regarding a lot of wildlife. And uh, one of the things that has been like this contentious debate in the world of wildlife and, and the law has been whether or not it's legal to keep and own uh, certain types of big cats like tigers and things like that. And one of the things that was featured in that documentary was that uh, obviously certain parties had you know vested interests in being able to do that. And they actually took, you know, small, smaller cats like little tigers and other cats like ocelots, things like that, um, to Congress with them and to lobby for the the right to keep these these pets. And they let the you know congressmen and women actually touch and interact with these cats. And that was very sneaky because what it did is when they said like, we shouldn't outlaw people interacting with these cats, suddenly everybody who was going to be voting on it was now involved in having done it. So if you said, I'm voting for this to be deemed as bad, you were condemning yourself. Very tricky tactics. But the reason I bring this up is because very recently that law was reversed. Tremendous movement in the U.S. in recent years, probably largely because of that documentary, which, again, I'm not a huge fan of. I think they let um, a, a lot of horrific people off very lightly as like, oh, look at these goofy characters. Um, when Joel McHale did a follow-up to interview with everyone that they put on Netflix, um, that was the thing that they all said, that like you, you know, Netflix portrayed this guy as being goofy and fun, and he was like the most horrific person you've ever met. Like, he ruined so many lives. Uh, and then there was that other guy, that Doc, Doc, whatever his name was, who was like horrifically like brainwashing and grooming all these women um, into a cult, basically. And they were just like, isn't this guy crazy? LOL. But anyway, all that to say, there was this issue with big cats that seemed irreversible. And because the public eye got behind the right side of that argument, the law changed. And that is what's going to have to happen with alligator gar. Have I considered drifting the Devil's River by kayak? Where is the Devil's River? At least Lake Amistad. Where is that? Is that? In, I don't know where that is. You say Amistad, I think of the movie with uh, Matthew McConaughey. Which I think that's a Spielberg movie. Love to see a video of oh deer meat for dinner fishing together. Oh, yeah. That would be interesting. I, I don't, I haven't watched his channel in a long time and I don't know why. I can't remember if he, there was something on that channel that like rubbed me the wrong way or not. Cause he does a lot of catch and kill, which for certain fish, I don't, I don't care about. He like a catch and cook video with snakehead. Totally cool with that. Like, you know, probably a good thing actually. I can't remember if there's a reason I stopped tuning in or if it's just because I got too busy, you know, trying to make my own stuff that I couldn't just sit and watch YouTube all day. I don't know. But I mean, again, going back to, I'm a big believer, and again, going back to conservation, this is something that a lot of conservationists need to kind of change their perception on. Uh, you cannot let the uh, perfect become the enemy of the good, and that is actually a weakness. I have a professional conservation background. I've worked with some incredible conservationists, and I've had the opportunity to meet and work alongside some very famous conservationists. And one of the things that I've noticed is kind of a weakness in that industry is the tendency to let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Um, not compromising for victory, but holding out for the perfect victory. And then because you held out, you didn't get it. So, you know, even if there were things that, you know, um, that channel did that I wasn't quite on board with, maybe a bigger platform like that, I could use to get the message out further for conservation for certain species. So not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good is a big, big, important step in the conservation um, fight. Oh, that's funny. Somebody's comment. I won't read it out loud, but it was funny. The style 618 uses in his videos is exactly the same every single time. I think that's a big part of his success. I agree with you. 
Uh, his consistency is perfect. And he doesn't even catch big fish. I've talked about this before. You know, he never catches big fish, like, relatively speaking. Uh, but yes, uh, his style of filmmaking is extremely consistent, and I agree with you that is a huge part of why he is successful. Starting to get a massive headache. Uh, saltwater dar get larger than freshwater ones. That's not really something that's documented. That's kind of a word of mouth, you know, people tell each other they do. Uh, but if you look at the documents of, you know, where the largest gar in the world have been recorded, they were always in freshwater environments. I can't typically get a word in in these things, but thank you for your content. And another thanks for your conservation efforts. Um, I really appreciate the support. Thank you. That's from Jason Fulton. I appreciate that. What can I recommend for fishing for alligator gar when the bite is slow or if there is no gar action in the water? <sighs> Let me think, because typically speaking, there's, try to identify the reason. What I do is I try to identify the reason for that, because gar, you know, being wild animals have motivations. They have reasons for their behavior. You know, animals don't make random decisions. People do, because our survival is somewhat guaranteed. I can go to that gas station behind me and buy coconut water or food. I can pull over on the side of the road and go to sleep because there are laws that protect me, you know, within reason. Um, I have a home to go to. Um, nothing is going to eat me on the way home. Animals don't have that luxury, so every decision they make is informed by their environment. So try to identify first uh, a pattern in what you're seeing when these gar are, are feeding slowly or not at all. And you will pick up on these things like, uh, you know, the water is higher today and there doesn't seem to be any gar in this area. Or maybe they were biting in the morning and then in the middle of the day, it got really, really hot, really hot. And then as it cooled down, the bite picked up in the later part of the day. Are you fishing throughout the entire day? Are you fishing long enough to notice these things? Maybe it got too hot in the center of the day when you were fishing. You know, things like that. Uh, did a cold spell come through? Did the pressure change at all? Pick up on the patterns um, that contribute to having bad fishing days and then you'll be able to avoid them entirely. Also, persistence. Persistence, like I was saying a minute ago, you guys see videos that are you know 15, 20 minutes long, uh, but that is a cut down version of sometimes of you know a 12, 14 hour day. Devil's River is in southwest Texas, part of the Rio Grande drainage basin. You know, I actually was down uh, by the Rio Grande recently. Um, did not did not plan the trip very well, so the water was extremely muddy, and a lot of areas the parks had closed, so I couldn't access the river where I wanted to go. So I didn't get to fish that area. I had to drive somewhere else. But um, I might make another trip down there now that you mention it. Should I or should I not eat redfish I catch? In si no, don't. Sims and Braze Bayou. I would recommend you do not eat them. Sims and Braze Bayou are not clean. They're not. Definitely don't eat them. Hey, brother, what's the best bait for sheep's head? I've tried pretty much everything. No luck. Um, I'm not a great sheep's head fisherman, but the people I talk to who are, uh, tell me that crab is a really good bait. So like pieces of crab legs or fiddler crabs, if you can get your hands on them, they love that. Let's see. California pier fishing. That would be fun. Two biggest scam artists in the industry, nonprofits and big brands. Uh, that is an incredibly general statement that doesn't really accurately apply to the subject because it's too general. And what industry are we talking about? Let's see. If you're big brands equal conservationists, my man, if you if you think conservation is big brands, you've never worked for a conservation platform in your life. I'm, I promise you right now, uh, conservation organizations, even the, the bigger ones, uh, scrape by on funding, usually out of the goodness of rich people's hearts <laughs> that we, uh, you know, let somebody name a giraffe for $30,000 and now suddenly you have enough money to keep paying uh, your conservation partners across uh, over in Thailand or something like that. 
I can, I can promise you from experience that is not correct. Enjoyed seeing your collection of fishing equipment. Would be interested, oh yeah, I put that on Patreon. If you guys don't know, I did a huge video about all the fishing rods and reels I own on Patreon, uh, a recent one. Enjoyed seeing your collection of fishing equipment. Would be interested to see if you were to buy some of the super cheap fishing equipment on sites like Timu, uh, how it compares. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know. That would be an interesting video. A lot of the times, you know, certain fish don't really require super expensive equipment, so maybe it would work. Everybody kind of chiming in with the same correct thought. Um, don't eat fish from Houston Bayous. Yes, listen to all these guys. They are all correct. Do not eat fish from Houston Bayous. It's not worth it. The the, the risk of getting sick. Was the 300 pound gar you caught amazing to catch? Yeah, it absolutely was. Um, 300 pounds being an estimate, by the way. Somebody asked me, I'll tie this in with a question somebody asked me earlier that I was planning on answering. Somebody asked me to list all the records I've caught, and officially I have none. I have none. Um, that gar I caught was 8 feet 2 inches long with a girth of about 47 inches. Um, the world record, the biggest one ever authenticated, which unfortunately was killed in a net, so accurate measurements were taken. Uh, it was bycatch. It wasn't the target of the net fishing. Um, it was eight feet, five and three quarters, and it had a girth of 47 inches, I believe. It was either 47 or 40, it was somewhere between 46 and 48. It had about the same girth as mine. Um, and it weighed 327 pounds. So same girth, about that much longer. And it weighed 327 pounds after being dead for several hours. So that's why I say that it is very reasonable. Mine was at 300. Uh, if I had killed that fish and had it weighed, I, I think I would have broken uh, the Texas state record, but then why would you do that? It's not worth doing. Why would I ever do that? So yeah, 300 pound guard was amazing to catch. Um, I think I could have taken the record if I wanted it, but I just, what's the point? Like, honestly, having your name on a, like a web page that barely anybody's going to read is not worth killing an animal like that. Uh, the other two animals that I have unofficial records for that I would have broken a record for are actually animals that don't really, they're not things you have records for, but I found specimens that were far larger than the accepted length uh, when I was much younger. This is like 20 years ago. Um, I have caught an Eastern ribbon snake that was about six inches longer than the accepted record. And I caught a lesser siren that was a few inches longer than the accepted record, which is a type of uh, amphibian, really cool animal. KDB says he will be changing his profile picture and username. Yeah, I do recognize you because you're one of the most uh, like loyal subscribers. Like you comment on everything, and I appreciate that. So definitely let me know when you change it because I recognize your your handle when you comment. Am I a full time YouTuber right now? Yes, I've been full time for about a year. How bad do my hands smell after cutting bait and touching its organs? How do I get rid of the smell? Um, well, there's a couple things you can do. Number one. Um, they do smell bad. They smell bad, bad to horrible, depending on the type of fish you're catching. Tilapia might be the worst. They smell like rotten grass and dead fish, because uh, that's basically what you're dealing with when you cut them open. Uh, but essentially, um, carry a rag with you, get that off your hands as fast as possible, and use sand. If you're fishing on a riverbank, um, get a little bit of sand in your hands and rub that through your hands you know, aggressively when you wash them off in the water, and then use a rag. It doesn't solve the problem entirely. I mean, it's just part of the business. You're going to smell like dead fish if you fish with dead bait. But uh, that will help. And then you can buy soap that will um, is designed for hunters and fishermen. Uh, and some of it works, some of it doesn't. Uh, but I will say there was one, I can't remember the brand of it. It was like a bar of soap, and it really did take the smell away. It was really nice. One of the better gifts I've ever been given. Someone behind me in the window watching. No, I don't think so as he looks in all directions to make sure there is a lantern hanging if you see there's a lantern hanging over there i don't know maybe that's what you're looking at but there's nobody actually behind me in the window watching this have i heard of captain kirk kirkland's alligator guard guide yes he's tagged hundreds of gar for texas parks and wildlife and was instrumental in getting the limit set to one fish per day per person yes i'm very familiar with him he's an incredibly talented uh and important figure um, in the the fight for alligator gar conservation. Yes, I do know who he is. 
What's the coolest fish I've caught? Uh, depends on what you mean. Uh, alligator gar, my favorite fish. Um, carp are kind of a close second. I I just love them so much. But if like unusual fish, I, the video I'm posting tomorrow has one of the most interesting and unusual catches of my life in it. Let's see. When I use cut bait, do you use the body and the head? Uh, the way I use cut bait depends a lot on a couple of things. Number one, with how I'm presenting it. So how heavy I want it to be, where I want it to end up in the current, how much bait I have. So obviously I'm going to cut it into smaller pieces if I'm running out. And uh, yeah, the size of the fish I'm going for. But you can catch giant fish on smaller baits. This The phrase people use like big baits catch big fish. Well, yeah, they do. But also small baits can also catch big fish. Uh, the biggest alligator gar of my life I caught on a half a mullet about that big. You know, you'll see guys who know what they're doing, who are very good. They'll catch alligator gar that are very big on like half a buffalo. But you can also catch those fish on smaller baits. So the condition and the movement of the water is kind of key on how I decide to cut up baits. Will this live stream be posted like the other one? Yeah, when you finish the live stream, um, it uploads itself. Hopefully it won't cut out. Uh, pieces like the other one I did for three hours and it cut out chunks of it, uh, which was sad because I was like bragging about my sister, which I'll just throw this in here now. Um, I have like five sisters, y'all. Uh, but uh, my oldest sister, who is a little bit younger than me, uh, is actually uh, she basically runs the Texas Sea Center's education department, uh, incredibly experienced in uh, in wildlife conservation education. Uh, which is awesome. She, For her age, she has far more experience than I do. So I'm throwing this shout out back in there again. My sister Juliana is exceptionally gifted and talented in this, uh, this industry. She's going to make big moves in it. But yeah, back to your original question. That got cut out of the other one because they upload themselves. You don't get to edit these. Or at the very least, not the way I'm doing it at the moment. So yeah, it will be uploaded after it loads itself. Might take a little bit. I have soap... Sh I have a soap-shaped metal bar that works well for removing smells on hands. Interesting. Clean under your fingernails. They hold a lot of odor. Yes, definitely. Use a, a toe knife like, like Frank from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Don't do that. Have a good night. Keep applying that pressure. One million subs soon. Oh, well, I hope so. Maybe not soon, but eventually we'll get there. I appreciate it. Hi, guy. Hello. How long do you give sharks to run before setting the hook? Uh, not long at all. Um, the the practice that I try to abide by is at maximum I do like a 10 count. like, And that depends on how I'm fishing. So if I'm fishing like when I caught that shark off the dock in Florida, I gave it a few seconds. Because there was no resistance when he picked up the bait. He picked up the bait and he started moving away with no resistance. So the hook wasn't setting automatically because he wasn't running into the end of the line. It was a circle hook. That's why I'm doing that. Um, so I gave him a second because sharks will a lot of times they'll pick up the bait, they'll move a little bit, and then they'll like eat the rest of it. But if I'm fishing a rig set out, you know, 100 yards, 150, 200, 300 yards into the surf, the way the rigs are set up is those weights, they dig into the sand so the fish will pick up the bait. And generally they'll start moving away and they've got a certain amount of line that is loose. And then they hit the resistance of the bait by the time they've taken it back. So hitting the resistance... Um, of the spider weight, the big heavy spider weights, will set that hook. So by the time that you notice them tearing on the rod, that hook has already done its job. So you got to get in there real fast. Uh, look, watch, I'm going to, everybody, subscribe to the H-Town Anglers team. They are much better at shark fishing than I am. My specialty is freshwater and alligator gar, and I'm pretty decent at carp. Uh, they are the, the shark guys that I recommend. If you want to know about shark fishing, ask them because they know. What's the best brand, of, best brand of coconut water? Should get them to sponsor me. What is this one? I don't even know where the focal. It's like at the top. These ones are good. I like these ones a lot. I like that they come in a can so that, you know, they, the metal stays cold. Saw the Joe Rogan podcast where he was watching my video. Super cool. Yeah, I was excited about that. Let's see. My most underrated catch? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. At this point, I've got almost 400 videos up. So when people ask me, like, what's your favorite video you've made? Totally normal question, but I can't even remember. Like, they just... 
I can't even remember all of them. So most underrated catch, I don't know. What circle hooks do you use and how do you bend them? Is there a certain brand? Yes, I use uh, Team Catfish circle hooks, uh, the Nautilus style hooks. And um, you bend them with heavy pliers and they will, you know, stretch out. You don't want to bend them past a 90 degree angle like the... Uh, the part that'll come up, obviously they're gonna, it's gonna point in still. But that the shaft, as it comes up to the barb, you don't want that beyond a 90 degree angle or it, it'll just peel right off. You want it right at that 90. So not set in like they come, but bend it out to 90, you're gold. So Team Catfish hooks, very good. You can get them at Walmart. Well, love to see you come. Oh, they also rust incredibly fast. So that's a big thing with shark fishing that's kind of a myth. People will cut the line and they'll be like, oh, the hook will fall out. A lot of hooks don't rust as fast as people think, but I've done tests. Actually, that'd be a good video, thinking about it, doing tests with hooks to see which one rusts the fastest. Uh, team catfish hooks rust, even in freshwater, extremely fast. Basically, once I use one, it's done because by the time I get home, it will be rusting. So even if you lose the hook, those ones legitimately do rust very quickly. Would love to see you come to Maryland and catch something nice and big. I'm from Baltimore. Good morning, Baltimore. I'm not going to sing for you. Another, um, that was a Broadway cut right there. I don't know how many Broadway fans we have in the crowd, but I'm a, I'm a theater guy. If you guys didn't know, you probably didn't know, but I do love the theater. Let's see. Would love to catch some kind of big fish. Yeah, I know. Uh, Baltimore would be cool. What are some of the cool fi coolest fish I've caught? Uh, I've got to go with alligator gar. They're just my favorite. And snakehead. Snakehead was so cool. Let's see. How's the YouTube verification process going for you? Slowly. Hoping to catch my first Texas uh, cichlid this year. Any bait recommendations? Uh, shrimp, live worms. Honestly, if you get some kind of meaty bait in their face, uh, they'll take it. And if they're nesting, just annoy them with it. And they'll bite it out of frustration. You know, go fish shallow creeks and stuff where you can see through the water. San Antonio has a ton and the water's clear enough so that you can actually like watch them moving around. You can irritate them into biting even if they're not hungry. Let's see. Do I think jacks come out when it's cold? Planning on going to the jetties tomorrow. Um, look at Beach Bomber Fishing's channel. I don't I don't know if he did that. I think he released the video. He's just slayed on the other day. He and some other guys caught a ton. Um, and one of the things that uh, they were really, really keen on was just getting the weather perfect. Again, he's a much better saltwater fisherman than me. Um, so I would say ask him for tips on that. But I know they're there right now. You just gotta, you gotta get the weather right. So ask him, he'll know. Kitty P says one of his favorite videos is the one where I ended up catching, I caught like a blue and uh, snapping turtle and then a big flathead. That was a good one. The, the catch on that flathead was very tricky because I was trying to climb down this like incredibly steep concrete embankment. It was very risky. The stingray video where I kept licking the camera. You know what? That video where I caught, I caught this giant stingray. I was about 150 pounds worth of stingray. It was very big. And uh, I caught it on a size one bait hook. This little, like tiny. And uh, because the hook was so small, and I knew I had a stingray, because you can tell by the way they fight, and you can tell that they're big, I couldn't lean into the the fish the way you're supposed to. I had a 12-foot rod, bad for stingray, and I couldn't you know, put my hips down and, and set my weight into it and use my legs to fight it with a straight arm like you're supposed to, because it would have pulled the hook. And I, I was so desperate to land the fish that I was like using my back to, to like fight it without pulling the hook and I caught the fish and I hurt my back severely and it still hurts to this day. I still have to go through like very, very, very careful steps every single day to warm my back up so it doesn't hurt itself again. Ever caught a paddlefish? No, but I'd love to. Um, really cool fish. Psychic Sec Toad says the Stingray video is his favorite. It was a good one. That was that was a raw, like unedited video. I think there might be like one or two edits in there. Um, once I get the landing process started, mostly to uh, edit language out. Uh, but I, the whole fight is in there. Thoughts on people hating on carp, even sometimes throwing it on the bank. Uh, disgusting. 
throwing a living fish on the bank to die is deplorable. Even if it's an invasive species, have some decency, be, res you know, be a decent human being and dispatch the animal properly. So if you're in an area where carp are invasive and they're harmful to the environment, I understand. If you're going to dispatch them, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, but throwing them on the bank to die a slow death is ridiculous. And I know there might be somebody who will jump on here and be like, oh, but when you catch bait, you throw them in a bucket with no water. I do. And then I put the camera down and I dispatch them all immediately before I start filming again. I just don't show you that bit. Am I going shark fishing this spring? Yes. I've actually been shark fishing several times over the last couple of weeks. Uh, just uh, haven't caught anything. So yes, I will be shark fishing uh, quite a bit this spring. Best carp fishing rig? Uh, probably just a, a simple hair rig. You know, fish with, fish with Carl, formerly Carl and Alex Fishing. Um, they have a really great um, channel, like a second channel on like tips for like how to rig for stuff like carp and um, they, they go over some really great basics but a simple hair rig is probably the best. Slowly getting back into fishing, never really had much training but what tips would you give a first time fisherman? Uh, don't overthink it. First off, identify what you wanna catch because again, saying like you wanna get back into fishing is like saying you wanna get back into sports. Um, you know, what do you what do you wanna do? Or do you wanna be a, gymna a gymnast? Do you wanna be a martial artist? Do you wanna be a track field athlete? Like, do you wanna catch alligator guard? Do you wanna catch halibut? Do you wanna catch you know, little sunfish? Do you want to go fly fishing for trout? Like, what do you want to do? Identify that. Keep it simple. Talk to people in the areas you want to fish. So local knowledge is always going to be the most important knowledge and take their advice. That is what I would recommend for a first time fisherman. <laughs> James Orm says, favorite video of mine is when you almost fell in between the two channels at the sewage plant. I think maybe uh, but I was walking in between them. I did fall. It wasn't a sewage plant. It's actually it's actually in Sugarland somewhere. Um, I'll give the spot away because I didn't catch any fish in that video. The whole point is I made the video because I couldn't catch fish and I fell. Um, it was um, it's First Colony Boulevard. There's like a waterway next to it. I can't remember the name of the street. Ah, oh, I can't remember. But there's a waterway next to it that has like these the separating channel, like a separating culvert the massive like culverts running through it. And I was trying to jump from one to the other and I fell like straight in between it, like into all these like water hyacinth plants and had to like climb out. It was very, very uh, painful and very hard to do. What does my wife think about my fish? Oh, wait, is that my wife? Yeah, okay, I think that is my wife. Unless one of you guys found her username and you're just copying it. Uh, what does... My wife supports my fishing. She she is um, the backbone of this channel that you guys very rarely get to see. But I can only do what I do because of the support of my amazing and beautiful wife. I'll figure out if that's really her when I get home. Because you never know if somebody's impersonating somebody else. I don't think she commented on any of the live streams I've done before. I'm a little nervous. I'm about to tell a, a complete stranger that I love them. But I love my wife dearly. Oh. Uh, where are you at right now? In a parking lot. I'm not going to tell you where I am. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just in a random parking lot in Sugarland. I was driving back from my family's house watching the fights in Angleton, Texas. I live in Sugarland and I'm in between because I said I would do this live stream at 8 o'clock and 8 o'clock hit on the road. Guys, we are... Okay, battery life is still doing good. I just checked the battery life. I was worried it was going to die. Uh, the phone was going to die, but it's actually lasting longer than I expected. Oh, let's see. I just release any carp I catch. We are not making any impact at all by leaving them on the bank anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, where are you located? Because, I mean, in Texas, they're, they're kind of hesitant to say this on a broader platform, but Texas Parks and Wildlife have pretty much admitted that you don't have to kill them anymore. Um, you know, changing a law is very complicated. It takes a lot of time and work. So even if the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is, or any wildlife department is basically like, yeah, no, we don't really care about this law anymore. They may not go through the steps to turn it around if it's not a huge deal. So the regulations might still say you have to dispatch carp in Texas, but Texas Parks and Wildlife actually don't consider them invasive anymore. They're considered a naturalized species. You don't have to kill them in Texas. So yes, if you're talking about Texas, you're absolutely correct. Uh, as far as other states, um, 
I don't really know. I don't really know the uh, the impact that carp. I'm thinking common carp. I know some of the big head carp up north are just. It's like a swarm. It's like they're drowning in them up there. What are the best baits for catfish slash gar? Um, depends. I mean, you're naming two different fish, and they do like to eat different things. Uh, for example, live shad is one of the best catfish baits you could ever hope to use. But me personally, and this is going to change based on who you are and where you're going. Me personally, where I fish, alligator gar don't like shad. Or at the very least, they don't like them nearly as much as cut carp or mullet or buffalo. Carp, buffalo, mullet, tilapia are like the four horsemen of the garpocalypse, if you will, for bait. Those are the ones that I like to use the most. Shad are easy to get, and they even get pretty big in some of these bayous, but the gar don't like them. That's Anytime I'm gar fishing and I throw out shad, I get catfish back. So I would say um, keeping, keeping that in mind, live baits are really good for catfish, like shad, big shad, catfish love them, uh, carp. Buffalo, tilapia, and mullet are good for gar, but I mean, the catfish will eat those too. The shark videos were cool AF. Thank you. Thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, I think that is my wife. I love you too. I'm trying to sometimes. Oh, there it is. I love fishing. I haven't done it in a long time. I miss it so much. What fishing gear for a beginner? And then down below, he says just freshwater fish. So if you're going for smaller freshwater fish, if you're not going for like big game freshwater fish, like big blues, flatheads, and gar. If you want like bass and things like that, um, you know, get yourself a, a simple spinning rig. So a spinning reel, maybe a two, three thousand size, something easy to handle. Um, I would start with monofilament first. Get yourself some 10, 12 pound monofilament on there. Uh, you know, a a lighter action rod, so something like a, a medium action rod. And, uh, you know, try experimenting with some basic rigs, you know, monofilament down to a J-hook with a float, uh, like a foam float that you can insert in between with some split shot. Maybe try some minnows, uh, live minnows on a rig like that will catch you all kinds of great fish. You can catch bass, catfish, uh, the occasional gar, bowfin, will come up and take a live minnow on a simple rig like that. Uh, keep it simple, and then as you gain confidence, switch to artificials, and you'll start having fun catching fish on uh, artificial baits. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but I always look down at the bayous when driving, hoping to see you. Might You might one day. I've been doing a lot more river fishing recently than bayou fishing uh, as, of the, as of the last couple of months. As of this year, I caught some large alligator snapping turtles. Yes, um, wait, what, there's a question in there. I saw another Houston YouTuber catch them last week. Was that the same spot? I didn't watch that video because I can't think of who you're talking about. So I'm not exactly sure. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I can't, I can't remember who you're talking about. So maybe, it might be. Um, Buffalo Bayou, as it runs through downtown Houston, lots of alligator snapping turtles. That's one of the reasons I'm not fishing there a whole lot right now, because I don't want to catch them. Just caught my first gar at Bray's Bayou. Oh, that's awesome. Let's see. Lots of hearts. Thank you. I heart y'all too. What size hook do I recommend for the carp? Um, well, I would recommend going on a tackle website where you can get proper carp hooks. Um, and then, you know, I use, I think I use the Gamakatsu Super G carp hook in size four is my absolute favorite. Do I bottom fish them or bobber? Carp hooks, I bottom fish. I use bottom rigs for carp. Unless I find a spot where they're feeding on top of the water and then I will run just a free-lined piece of bread, and I'll flick out a piece of bread on top of the water where they're coming up and feeding, and they'll grab that piece of bread. You give them just a second, and you set that hook on them. And when you set the hook on those carp, don't ugh, you know lean into it real hard. It's You're not even pulling the rod back. You're almost like you're holding... Imagine you're holding a stick out horizontal, and a, and a kid tries to grab it. Now imagine lifting it up where the kid can't reach it. Like you're lifting the stick above someone's grasp. Like you're coming up with it like this, like that. 
that's how you want to set the hook on carp when you're free lining because those lips are soft. That's all it takes. What action is your new Big Cat Fever casting? Is the heavy action? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, no, the extra heavy is not too small for gar. If you catch some really big gar, I mean, you catch a fish 250 pounds, uh, you will probably thank yourself for having the extra heavy action. And yes, they do work on sharks. What rivers do I hit? Uh, most of them. Brazos, Trinity, San Jacinto. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I've gone out to the Rio Grande before. I, I fish quite a number of rivers uh, in my videos. Can I answer? John's mother has, oh, is this a riddle? John's mother has four children. The first child is called Monday. The second is called Tuesday. And the third is Wednesday. What is the name of the fourth? It's John. Because it's John's mother. I catch a lot of gar on live finger mullet in Florida. Yeah, you know, what kind of gar are you catching? Um, I didn't think there were a lot of alligator gar. Are they like long nose gar? Finger mullet, live finger mullet are good for almost anything. That's a, that's a gold star bait right there. I'm also in the Houston area, so where would a good area for, or structure is good? Is this a question or? Where would be a good area or structure is good for, oh, like where's a good area to fish uh, for bait fish? I mean, honestly, if you just go into any of the like smaller bayous in the downtown area, you can catch lots of bait fish with a cast net there. If you don't catch tilapia, can you return to the water? Uh, you're not supposed to. Hi, I'm from Maryland. Could you please give a shout out to Robin and Jay? Robin and Jay, I hope you all are having a great evening. Maryland, beautiful up there. I would love to go to Maryland sometime. Do I use bait casters? Yes, uh, when I was fishing for snakehead in Florida, uh, I used bait casters. Um, I have a really, really, really nice one that I, I use that I like quite a lot. Oh, you're catching long nose gar in Florida with finger mullet. That sounds like fun. Long nose gar can get big. And they're they're good fighters. They jump a lot. One of my underrated videos where I caught a a 40 pound spotted gar. I don't I, I've caught 40 pound alligator gar, which when they're younger do have similar features as spotted gar, but I've never caught a 40 pound spotted gar. I don't think I've ever, I don't think they get that big. If they do, that's like a, a record that I don't hold. So it was probably just a, a, an alligator gar that had features similar to a spotted gar. you subtract one from 19 to get to 20 um i don't know like negative numbers i'm not a math guy don't ask me math questions um is this my first live stream no i did like one in when i was in florida a few months ago i don't do them very often i'm trying to get better at it has joe rogan responded at all to your offer of speaking about catch and release and why it's important uh no uh joe rogan is unbelievably busy and like there are legitimately famous people who will shout out Joe Rogan's podcast being like you know when can I get on the Joe Rogan podcast um you know and they are not on the Joe Rogan podcast so while it is true now that Joe Rogan does know I exist before he didn't know I existed he knows I exist now um he probably still isn't aware of me if that makes sense so like he knows a guy catches big alligator gar on YouTube but that's probably the extent of his knowledge about me. He probably, you got to think how many people tag Joe Rogan and stuff every day. It's probably in the millions, you know. So no, he's not responded to that. Uh, never say never. You never know. Do I prefer spinning reels or bait casters? Depends on the mood. I go back and forth. Um, for lure fishing, for like uh, topwater fishing, bait casters all day. So great. Um, for really big fish. I prefer spinning reels because the the spool when line gets taken off, um, it is much much louder on camera, and I like that. It makes that really beautiful singing noise that is so good on YouTube. 
What do I think about Edwards beating Usman and the fight of the night between Fazeev and Justin Gaethje? Uh, Edwards beating Usman was impressive. Um, he cheated a lot. Um, you know, he I think he like, did it all happen in the same round? It was a horrific fence grab. Uh, and then he kicked him low. And then there was something else. that was a glove grab. A good old fashioned, you know, fingers in the cuff of the glove to stop the takedown. Um, so, I mean, but that aside, I thought he fought a great game plan. I think uh, they recognized what worked in the last fight regarding uh, kicking Usman on the open side. Usman has a tendency to dip down. That's how he got knocked out in the last fight. And they made that a primary weapon. Um, there's a there's a principle in martial arts called the southpaw double. And when you're standing southpaw, so if you're standing uh, with the right side forward, you know, left side rear, if your opponent is standing orthodox, so if you and I are facing each other and I've got my... Ah, I dropped the phone. If you and I are facing each other and uh, I've got my right side forward, so my left hand is my power hand, my right hand is facing you, and you're standing in a mirrored stance. So your left hand is forward and your right hand is back and we look like mirror opposites. The sides of our body are open to be punched and kicked by the power sides, by the back hands and back legs. And the southpaw double or the southpaw triple as it's sometimes called, is the ability to strike with your power hand, kick low with your power leg and kick high with the power leg to the open side. And uh, Edwards made that the, the cornerstone of his game plan tonight, and it worked beautifully. Uh, Fazeev and Justin Gaethje, you know, I mentioned it earlier, incredible fight. Um, a really good example of how to slow someone down. Because Fazeev was much faster than Justin Gaethje, but it didn't matter because Gaethje figured out how to slow him down by putting a pace on him. That's one of the ways you can slow a guy down who's faster than you is you put a pace on him. You make them fight at an uncomfortable pace where they can't remain faster than you over the course of the fight. They slow down and now suddenly you're operating on the same speed. And he also used a technique that involves something called prior perception. So Fazeev's head is very hard to find because he's constantly, you know, he's using all those like Muay Thai leans. And um, Gaethje would throw a hook and some of the hooks would land, some of the hooks would go back behind his head. But when they went behind his head, he'd cuff the back of the head, dig that elbow down, pull his head down, and then he would throw the cross counter uppercut with the other hand. And if you can't find a guy's head, uh, grab a hold of it with the other hand and don't focus on punching his head because it's, you know, if he's trying to move around at any given time, you may not know exactly where his head is. But prior perception is the ability to, the, for the human body to instinctually understand where different parts of your own body are. So by closing my, no, my eyes, um, I can just touch my nose 100 out of 100 times without looking because you know where different parts of your body are just instinctually. It's called prior perception. You know, eyes closed, I can reach above my head and put my hands together, you know? If you have your hand around the back of a guy's head in what's called a single, single collar tie, you're not trying to punch his face, you're trying to punch your own hand and the guy's head is just in between. So he would throw that hook, slap that collar tie on, and he knows where his own hand is and he's punching to his own hand, and as a result, Fazeev's head is in between. What's up? We're live streaming. Let's see, let's see, let's see. I ought to talk about Baltimore. Never been to Baltimore. So Fazeev is very dangerous. He is very dangerous. I mean, if you can knock out Javier Dos Santos, you're dangerous. Gaethje just fought a brilliant game plan. That jab really came into play in the last round, too. Uh, again, if you have a guy who primarily likes to lean away from strikes, double up on the jab. Because he's going to lean just out of range for that second jab. And as he's coming back into range, you throw that second jab. Oh, you found the Ford hubcap. In, in one of my videos, I was cast netting and I found a hubcap. And, um, you know, there is so much garbage in some of the places I fish. You can't take it all with you. A lot of people are like, I don't understand why you didn't take all the garbage with you. It's because there's thousands of pounds of it. Uh, so I can't take it all back with me. And somebody found one of the hubcaps that I found um, in a fishing spot recently. I saw that. You sent me a picture of it. I saw a picture. 
Hey bud, this is Kevin. I'm in Florida. I watch every video just saying what's up. Thank you for chiming in. I appreciate the support. Oh, a long nose gar. Oh yes, that video. Uh, I wouldn't say that. That fish wasn't 40 pounds. I hope I didn't say that in the video because it definitely wasn't a 40 pound fish. It was very big though. How long am I growing the hair? Um, I've already got a haircut recently. You guys probably can't tell because I just had it cleaned up. But this is actually shorter than it was like a month ago. Mm -hmm. Bison Strikes Fishing, by the way, chiming in, was asking me that. I think that might have been your video somebody was referencing earlier about another YouTuber catching a snapping turtle. I, I did see your video. I think that might have been the one they were talking about. But I, I can't remember where you were. Yeah, I think we'll go through maybe one or two more questions and then we'll check out of here because it's getting late and I do need to get home. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but like I have been very open about the fact that I am a martial artist first and then everything else comes second. You guys only see a part of me. You know, you see the the conservation educator and the fisherman side of me and you only see a bit of the conservation educator part of me too because fishing is such a weird format you can't really start the education process uh the way i like to do it until actually you have the animal in your hands so the timing for it is very small uh but i've been a martial artist for 20 years and it's like the core of my identity so when i watch these events like fiziev or fiziev i can't say his name right fiziev i think fighting um you know, just engaging things like that i'm screaming like with excitement just yelling and uh, my voice is starting to go let's see when will i live stream again oh uh, I, I don't know accidentally caught a 57 inch paddlefish in the ohio river first time i'd ever seen one it was completely shocked yeah they're amazing animals love saltwater fishing i don't <laughs> on a good day it's fun but man i prefer freshwater fishing have i been to arkansas no but i want to will i do an mma channel uh probably not um i've thought about it uh the amount of work that goes into just establishing and making a single channel successful is so consuming that I don't think I could dedicate the time to doing a second one. At least not right now. Maybe in the future I will. What martial art? So I've trained quite a few. Um, when I was, like like most people, when I was younger, I started training in Taekwondo. Uh, the ITF style, not the WTF style. So the World Taekwondo Federation style is what you see in the Olympics. A lot of spin kicks, a lot of um, no punches to the head, a lot of like push off kicking to the head, stuff like that. Uh, ITF is more karate based, so a lot of straight line punches and straight line kicks, things like that. Um, that's the style that I learned. And then from there, I went into um, boxing. And from boxing, I went to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and then to Muay Thai. And then um, somewhere in there, probably about the time I started doing Jiu Jitsu, you know, um, collegiate style, like freestyle wrestling. So I'm a mixed martial artist, technically. <laughs> Currently trying to catch Gar, just moved to Tennessee. Um, good luck, let me know if you get one, just please put it back. Psychic Psych Toad says he's all about MMA as well. This channel is perfect for his tastes. I appreciate it, I'm glad you're here. Ever done any magnet fishing? Yes, I actually have a magnet for magnet fishing. Um, I have one magnet fishing video. It's on my Patreon currently, but I do intend to break it out for the main channel. Black alligator gar, melanistic alligator gar. Um, yeah, I've never caught one myself, but I've seen photos of other people who have caught them. Beautiful, beautiful animals. I'm thinking of experimenting with barbless hooks for easy removal for the fish's sake. Do you think a barb makes a big difference keeping the fish on during the fight? Um, if you're able to maintain a constant pressure, I don't think so. I, I think circle hooks as well. I think J hooks have the tendency to slip a little bit. That's a debate that a lot of carp fishermen have is whether or not hooks should be barbed or unbarbed. The argument being that if it's not barbed, it might slip and repenetrate multiple times during the fight. So have you really saved the fish more damage? Uh, but circle hooks, because the configuration is, it comes back on itself so tight 
the odds of it slipping out and then rehooking are incredibly small. So yes, it might slip out, you might lose the fish, uh, but the principle of like maintaining as little damage as possible still there. So if you're using circle hooks, 100%, I don't think there's a debate, uh, it is more beneficial. It's hard to keep your bait on, but it is better for the fish. Oh, you're talking about inches instead of pounds when it came to the long nose gar. Yes, it was very long. It was a good fish. What type of self-defense do I recommend for a 65-year-old man? Um, Nothing taught in a mall. So basically, the self-defense has several tiers that I would recommend. And I'm being very serious when I say this. Number one, learn how to talk to people in a way that will diffuse tense situations. I have I've been attacked by people. Um, I you know I worked in a profession. I worked in the security profession. I've had people try to hit me with weapons, chains. I've had people flash like guns at me. And I've had one guy who tried to block the door I was walking through, and he pulled his jacket back when there's a gun in his pants, and he tried to like hold me there with a gun to convince me why he should be allowed into um, the facility with his gun. Um, you have to know how to talk to people in a very calm, authoritative, but not threatening manner to persuade people to do what you want them to do as if it's what they wanted to do. Learn that. Le read verbal judo. Um, take a class in verbal judo. That is the first thing I'd recommend. But as far as the actual physical part of the altercation is concerned, um, especially if you're older, I don't recommend learning spending a lot of time like learning like ground fighting techniques or anything like that um, learn some basic like framing techniques from Muay Thai Muay Thai is really good about building like frames to protect yourself and at the end of the day that's your main focus you're not trying to win a fist fight you're trying to take as little damage as possible before you can disengage and get away so maybe some Muay Thai um, reach out to my man Morgan Morgan the yoga flame on Instagram amazing Muay Thai coach um, being able to frame off on people, keep them at bay, protect your head, you know, protect, um, you know, your vitals by tucking your chin, things like that. Taking as little damage as possible before you can frame out and get away. Yo, wildlife, you've inspired me. I don't have gar in my parts of New York State, but we have good cats. I used to be a bass only, thought it was boring, just sitting and waiting, but I was wrong. Yeah, fishing's great. I'm glad I could um, be of some inspiration for you. I was in New York City a few months ago, and I caught some beautiful common carp in Central Park. You, Central Park has some beautiful carp in it. Really gorgeous. I wanted to catch a, uh, a mirror carp, but I didn't. But man, yeah, your New York lakes have good fish. Can someone in the 30s start doing martial arts? Yes, it is never too late to study martial arts. Um, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. If your goal is to become a professional fighter, maybe let go of that goal. Um, you know, it's it's not worth taking brain damage in your 30s. But everyone's got different goals. And yes, you can absolutely start learning martial arts in your 30s. You can get very good at it in your 30s too. You know, there's so many different types of martial arts you can start learning as well. Whether you're interested in the grappling aspect like wrestling or jiu-jitsu, um, Muay Thai, boxing, 100%. If you're in your 30s, start training martial arts. Yes, yeah, Psychic Psych Toad agrees. Never too late to start learning martial arts. I ag agree 100%. I'm a purple belt in martial arts. So what kind of martial art are you a purple belt in? Are you going to go back and try to catch again that gar that was a couple inches short of the world record? Um, I have thought about this an extensive amount, and here's what I've come to the conclusion on. If I ever catch that alligator gar again, you will not know about it. Unless it is in a... Again, even though, you know, I guess, you know, I didn't have any tags for the fish and alligator gar, unlike carp and things like that, they don't really have unique patterns where you can be like, oh, this is the same fish I caught five years ago. Um, so unless I caught it in the same area, it would be very hard to tell if it was the same exact fish. But I have decided that if I ever go back to that area and I catch that fish again, you will not know about it. It will not be put on YouTube. Carp fishing is underrated. Yes, Absolutely. Who do I think won, Leon or Kamaru Usman? I thought Leon got the decision. I thought he fought the better fight tonight. Do I think the Brazos River is worth fishing for gar? I've gone to Memorial Park like 10 times, but I've only caught fish rarely. Uh, if you're talking about Memorial Park and Sugarland, that is a difficult area because the current where you have that public access uh, carves out the bank in a weird way where it's very hard to hold bait into um, the area where the gar are hanging out. 
They tend to be on the other side of the bank. Uh, the Brazos River as a whole, yes, you can catch spectacular fish in it. I've caught amazing alligator gar in the Brazos River. Many, many people have. Just like any river, you got to study it and figure out where the current's going to work in your favor, or where the features are going to work in your favor. But yeah, absolutely. Am I going to do another collab with Philip from Bites and Strikes? I remember seeing that video. I want to see y'all filming again. Absolutely. We'll, we'll work together again. He's not, I mean, he's on right now, you know. Maybe he doesn't want to. No, I'm just kidding. He probably does. Um, yeah, no, I think we'll work together again. Let's see. World Classic Baseball is fire right now, by the way. You know, baseball is interesting. When it's exciting, it's exciting. Um, takes a lot for me to get into it. You're a purple belt in Taekwondo. That is awesome. Taekwondo is my base martial art. Um, you know, it's it's always there with me. You know, even when training Muay Thai, you know, there's, there's elements of Taekwondo that I, I weave back into that. Defense, not offense. I'm trying to... So this is the problem when people like comment between like they'll comment one thing and then they'll finish their thought after a bunch of other people have jumped in and I don't know what the comment was in reference to because it's so far back I can't remember what what kind of thought it was following up. Have I ever fished Lake Texoma? Um, I haven't, I haven't, but I'd like to. It's all it's a big water. I'd probably want to do it with a guide. Did I have any luck when I went out to Big Thicket? I didn't. Um, I actually ran into like a team of guys that were hunting with dogs and I, they actually invited me to go with them and I did, um, but we didn't get anything. Bite the strike says, let's go. We'll, we'll put it together, man. We'll get out there. Is there any way to avoid gar while catfishing? <laughs> Every time I try for a trophy catfish, I always catch gar and I can't break my cat, can't break my catfish on. You can't catch catfish. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just a part of fishing any water. You're going to have species that you desire, and then you're going to have the species that gets to the bait first. For me, it's always the same way around, or the opposite way around. It's always, I'm always going after gar, and the catfish pick up the bait. So they typically tend to like the same waters. Honestly, what I'd recommend, if a fish picks up the, learn the difference between the run of a gar and a catfish because there are little differences. Gar tend to run towards open water. They like to move to the other side of the current. They like to go uh, against the current quite often. Um, and they will run parallel to the bank for incredible distances if you let them. Catfish tend to go straight towards the deepest part of the water. They tend to go towards structure. So the runs can be a little bit different. If you're worried about Gar taking your bait, if you notice he's going off on that long run, just provide some resistance because he probably hasn't uh, taken the bait all the way yet. And, uh, you know, as long as your bait is, you know, something tough like carp or buffalo, he'll probably drop it. You might have to reel it in and recast, but you won't end up fighting with a gar. You can get the bait back and then reset it for catfish quicker that way. Also fish when it's cold. Um, gar don't like the cold, but big catfish will bite in the cold. As long as you're not fishing on the temperature drop, let it settle. You can catch big catfish when it's cold and the gar are less active. You have to film that gar, you may be able to find distinction patterns if you catch. No, see, here's here's what I'm thinking. Um, who records it? Does the gar die or live in the process? Um, you can you can get a world record and not kill the fish, but it's hard. And the reason is you have to measure these things and weigh these things. That's the real thing that matters with these records is weight. Um, you have to weigh them on state certified scale. So I would have to actually call someone to come out there with a state certified scale or you kill the fish and you take it to a state certified scale. And that is just, that's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna keep a fish, you know, roped up in the shallows for hours while somebody comes out there to, to weigh it so I can try to release it alive. It'll probably die in that time it takes to get someone out there. Um, and I'm certainly not gonna kill it to bring it to a certified weigh station. So uh, just, just be, just accept the fact, because I've accepted the fact, I will probably never hold a world record even though I could. And I've proven I have could because I've videoed the fact that I could. Um, I could probably get a world record alligator gar. And there are other guys who could do it too. Uh, the Fish Whisperer has caught you know gar up to eight feet long. And uh, they could easily weigh close to or more than the world record. He might have broken that world record. I don't know. 
because he is conservation minded and he releases those fish. So I'm never going to hold a world record because you kind of have to be willing to let the fish die if you're determined to get that record. And I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. So yeah, if I catch that big alligator dollar again, if it's that same fish and it's in that same area, I'm not going to put it on YouTube because also think about this. When I caught that fish originally, um, I waited for several weeks before I uploaded that video. And then the video didn't get big until several weeks later. So people who watched that video when it got famous and they were like, oh, I know exactly where that's at. First off, everyone told me they knew where it was and then everyone would tell me a different place. So <laughs> a lot of people who are convinced they know where it is don't really know where it is. Um, but the few people who probably do, because somebody will always know, you know, the world is not a mystery. Um, and I'm almost never the first person to fish any place I go, really. Um, for the few people that do recognize it, if I caught that gar a year ago, and let's say I catch it again 12 months later, because we're coming up on the year anniversary actually, and it's in the same place, now everyone knows that that's where it's going to be. That fish has moved on. I fished that spot a load of times after that. That fish is gone. Nobody's going to find that fish. Somebody might catch it later down the road, you know, I don't up river, down river, I don't know. Uh, maybe in a different river because all of these rivers in Texas connect at some point. You know, some fish go all the way down these rivers to the coast with a delta and they move between rivers through the delta. I was uh, shark fishing a few months ago and <laughs> I actually had like a, a six foot alligator gar come up and breach right in front of me when I was trying to like wade fish for bait. It was cool. So yeah, if I, uh, if I ever catch that fish again, if it's relatively close to that same area, you're not going to know about it. can mail the scale to get it certified. Oh, that's interesting. Weighing a 300, a 300 pound fish in the wild would be hard. Yeah, weighing anything over 200 pounds would be enormously difficult, especially considering I'm generally alone. I can't really think of a realistic way to do that. Again, it's not that important to me to hold the record. It's really not. If, if I wanted to have a serious go for it, I could have done it. Um, that is not why I do this. This show, there's a reason it's called wildlife and not like wildlife fishing or the fishing wild show or something like that. It's a conservation program. This show is a conservation program and fishing is just a tool to get what I believe are an underrepresented class of animals. Freshwater fish are underrepresented in zoos and aquariums. Not enough people get to see them. These amazing fish like alligator gar, not enough people get to see them. Fishing is just the way I put them on camera because you can't film underwater in a lot of these freshwater environments because it's just not clear enough to do. Same exact reason Jeremy Wade had the show he had. It was a conservation program where fishing is just the tool to put this amazing animal on camera for people to say, that's incredible. I wanna help protect that fish. I'm inspired now to learn more about this animal. That's the point. In fact, I'm gonna close out of here by telling a story that means the world to me and kind of sums up why I do this. So. I worked at the Houston Zoo for a long time. My wife works at the Houston Zoo and has longer than I have. That's where we met. And she's still there. She still works for the zoo. And she had a couple of uh, colleagues in the uh, education department, which is also where I worked when I was there. They went to a school that have, um, the, the zoo does like partner programs with like different schools throughout Houston uh, to like promote conservation and stuff like that. Um, and they, uh, they were doing a conservation program. I think it was an elementary school. They were younger children. I didn't actually get the grade level when the story was told to me, uh, but they were doing conservation partnerships with this younger age school. I'm going to say elementary level. And uh, they, the, all the kids in this class were presenting conservation projects that they had decided to do uh, to the, the educator team from the zoo that had come to like help them with these things. They had had this program going for a while and they were coming there to watch the children present these conservation programs or, or at least show what they had developed so far. And um, my wife, the, the two of her colleagues that were there sent her the photo and she sent it to me. And uh, one of the children, one of the children said, I decided to do my conservation, pro I'm getting choked up just saying this. I decided to do my conservation program on alligator gar because I saw one on the news. And the alligator guard that this uh, kid saw in the news that had inspired this child uh, to dedicate their attention to the conservation of these incredible fish, this alligator guard they saw in the news was the one I caught. 
because when they showed them the conservation like booklet that they had made on their project, it was a picture of me. It was a picture of me with an alligator gar. That had uh, inspired that child to dedicate their attention to learning more about these animals and deciding that they were worth protecting. That is the whole point of this channel. Yes, fishing adventures can be epic. Yes, they can be awesome. Sometimes the action is great. And the sport of fishing is great. I love the sport of fishing. If you consider yourself a sport fisherman, if you do it ethically, I am 100% behind you. It's so much fun. But the point is, the entire point is to film animals that people would otherwise never get to see because people get excited by wildlife when they see it. Not when they hear about it. Not necessarily when they read about it but when they see it and these animals don't get seen enough. And that's my goal is to let people see these animals and to see that they're worth protecting and conserving and allowing to live further into the future as these amazing pieces of history that they are. And that's why we do what we do. That's why this show is called wild life. Cause yes, it's a play on words, but it's a wildlife program. First, a fishing show. Second world records do not mean anything to me getting children like that excited about protecting alligator gar is what means everything to me. That's why we do what we do. So let me see. Uh, yeah, our batteries, our batteries going, if you're commenting and I don't get to it, I appreciate it. Um, but, uh, thank you so much for your support. Tune into the video we have coming tomorrow. A really great fish. That's going to appear tomorrow on a show that I've never caught before. Um, if you've caught one, let me know because I was doing some research on it and apparently they're kind of rare. So check in tomorrow. Looking for that video. It's going to go up. I appreciate everybody dropping in. I am checking out of here for now. Y'all have a great night.